Okay, you used oh, to. Oh, you had them both? Okay. <laughs> used to cut the doors out on the right hand side. I don't know why. Greg, we that's did a that great there. picture. Isn't that neat? My mother flew it up and said, here. This is why you're interested in rollable. I said, you're absolutely <laughs> That's right. tremendous, Greg. Things you remember on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> what and year would you guess this, this was, Greg? Huh? What year? What year? Uh, 58, I think. Okay. And it was one of those days where you went and Red McNitt rolled the car over. Yeah. You know, he'd go up on the bank. And I, that I remember very distinctly. So Jim Scott from Garland, Pennsylvania. Welcome. How, how did a Jim Scott get interested in car racing? Is that something that was sort of farm field type thing? Well, uh, we did mechanics all our life right. and, and drove tractors and whatever, but I had a friend, Richard Johnson, that drank a lot. And uh, <coughs> he came to my house at four o'clock in the morning and said, we got a, knocked on the door. Didn't, I don't know if he knocked on the door or not, but he came in my bedroom and says, we got to build a race car. And I, why do we need a race car? He said. <laughs> and, he says, because I just made a $10 bet with Rodney Peters that we were going to beat him on Sunday. Well, I said, we don't have a car. He said, I know where there is one. It's $100. He said, you got $50. I'll come up with $50. We'll have us a race car. So we went to Corey the next day, bought a 47, 40, or 46 or 47 Ford, two-door sedan, brought it home, took the upholstery out, uh, cut the fenders off, uh, that's all you did, and then you had a race car, but we needed roll bars. Well, we called around, nobody could put roll bars in for us, so we decided to go to the racetrack without any roll bar. And, uh, but on the way up, we stopped at a man's place called Warney Little, and he welded in some roll, roll bars for us, an old piece of two-inch pipe, he rolled it, welded around the back of my head, <laughs> And the only injury I had the first day I raced was when the roll bar fell down and hit me on the head. <laughs> <laughs> but I did finish third in my first race, and Rodney Peters finished behind me, and Dick got his $10, and I've been racing ever since. It's what just, year was this, Jim? It would have been 56. Did you say, and where would that have been? Pardon, sir? What, what racetrack? Was that rollable. rollable. That would be at the Rollable. No chance. And we, we left home early Sunday morning with that car, hooked on a 20-foot chain behind his 51 Ford. <laughs> and I steered, I steered the race car, and he hauled me up there, and we stopped and got the roll bars put in and, uh, and raced it and towed it back home. But the next week, we had a big improvement so in our towing. This was your first race? This was my first race. Your first race ever was a rollable? Rollable, yeah. My gosh. At first racetrack. I had been to uh, one other racetrack uh, when I was real young. My dad took me to a, to a racetrack, but I wasn't interested in racing. I mean, nobody was really interested in racing back then. Right. And we were just farm boys, you know. And uh, But the, the second week, a big improvement in our in our getting to the racetrack. We put a pipe to run the chain through a pipe so that you, the front car would stop the rear car. So you didn't have to drag the brakes all the time to keep the <laughs> chain tight. Great improvement. It was the second year of racing before I had a tow bar. Right. But now, who ran the racetrack at Rollable then? Who, who were the uh, uh, the owners themselves? The owners of the yeah. The there's Don McNett. And Red McNett, and I think there was another brother, wasn't there? Howard. What? Howard. Howard McNett. Okay, yeah, there was the three boys. And actually, uh, Red was, I think Red drove race car a little bit. Yeah. And uh, he was, he was easy there, the easiest one to get along with. Of course, Don was running the show, so he wasn't as easy to get along with it as, uh, but I don't know if it was my first year at Rollable or my second year at Rollable, I was working on a farm, making $75 a month. Mm -hmm. And we had what we needed, you know, but we also they had a speedway down by Sugar Grove called Skyline Speedway, and it ran Sunday nights. So we would tow to Rollable Sunday afternoon and race, and go to Skyline and race Sunday night. And uh, this is a little bit of 
important history about my racing because I won the feature at Rollerball and I won a, and I got $35. And I went to Skyline and I won the heat race, I got $5. And I won the feature and I got $35. You add that all up, you got $75. I made a month's wages in one Sunday afternoon. Yes. And needless to say, we've been racing ever since, you know. Right. Uh, what did you know about <coughs> Rollerball before you even went there? Did, had you scouted out the track? I had never seen it until yeah. we towed in there that day. So close your eyes and tell me how the track looked. Give, give me a description of the track. The, the, they called it a race track, but really it was an obstacle course. <laughs> it had a stream run through the center. Uh, the front straightaway, when you went into the first and second turns, there was a huge mud hole. Mm -hmm. And it kept, with the first few times we raced there, it was only six or eight feet in diameter. By the time we got done racing there, it was 30, 40 feet in diameter. It was this huge water puddle. And uh, cars always drowned it out, you know, because it's going through that water. And well, then you climb a hill, and the rear straightaway was probably elevated 50, 60 feet higher than the front straightaway. Then you, three and four, you broke down over a hill and across the bridge. And um, that bridge is where I lost my front teeth. Tell me about that. We might as well stop and tell me the story. <laughs> well, I, it had to have been the second year I raced here because I spent the winter building a flathead engine. I took it in our house and put it in our spare bedroom and <laughs> put a couple saw horses and a board in there. And, in and, your uh, bedroom? And, yeah, in the spare bedroom. Not in my bedroom, in the spare bedroom. <laughs> and uh, I worked all winter on that. I built me a race motor. Yeah. And uh, I ground it and polished it and, and uh, I saved up I think $35 and bought a racing camshaft. And a friend of mine gave me a set of adjustable lifters and I, that was a race engine, you know. Uh, probably had a total of uh, $100, $150 in it. And uh, then, so that would have been the second year and they had an extra lap race that was, uh, I didn't have the motor ready for the first couple weeks and we just run a stock motor and uh, <coughs> They had an extra lap race, and I don't know whether it was a 35 lap race, a 50 lap race, or whatever, but I know I started way, way back in it, and, uh, and I got up to where I figured I was second or third or fourth, and I was in pretty good shape, and I'd been running the car really hard, and it was overheating, so I shifted it back into high gear when I was going across the back straightaway, which was the elevated straightaway, Started down the hill, it hit my brakes, and I didn't have any brakes. I tried to get it back in second gear, and I didn't get it in second gear, and I went off the end of the bridge and plowed into the bank, and uh, of course, we, all I had for a seat belt was an old hame strap off a horse harness, <laughs> and I don't recall what I had for a helmet, but it wasn't much. And uh, I hit my face on the steering wheel, mm. knocked out my front teeth, and broke my nose and of course it knocked me unconscious and <clears throat> some guys come to the car to get me out and about that time another car come down over the bank and landed right on the roof of the car I was in and because I don't believe they stopped the race they, back in you just didn't stop the race no they yellow flag because, no there was no yellow flag there was either a green flag or a red flag you know and uh, <coughs> when I come to in the ambulance, which was an old Pontiac station wagon, there was another guy in there sitting on the cot at my feet, and he was split from here to here, and his scalp, it fell down, he didn't have any ears, because his scalp, it fell down over his ears. <laughs> Do you have any idea who that was, Skip? Red Walters. Who? Red Walters. Is that who that was? And... Well, I thought there was little squirts of blood coming up out of his head, you know, from the arteries, you know, I suppose. And I told him, people, that nurse, or the lady that was taking care of us, I said, 
don't worry about me. You better do something with him. You know? <laughs> but we got to the hospital and, and uh, got taken care of. And they wanted to keep me overnight, but I insisted on going home because my dad would kill me, number one, if I didn't show up to do chores that night. How old were you at this time, Jim? I would have been uh, just turned 18. Just turned 18, okay. So you, your first year then would have been, you were 17, really? You'd just gotten your license. Yeah, let's see how. No, I'll, I must have been 19 then, because I think I, I graduated when I was 17, and I, then I turned 18, so that way I would have been 19 when I lost my teeth. Uh, again, back to the back to the where we diverted a little bit from the normal track. You're coming down, you know, from a, from an elevated back stretch into three and four, and you go across the bridge. Now, tell me about the bridge. What was it? Was it a, a wooden bridge? Yeah, a, it was a, a no no plank bridge. Yep. Okay. Which yeah, quite narrow, probably twenty feet wide at the most. And that was over the creek. I mean, over I, the creek. Yeah, I got. I still got pretty slippery. Oh yes, they're very slippery. Because you just come through this big water hole, you still had water dripping off your car. <laughs> they didn't have to water the track because you kind of watered it for them as you went along. <laughs> 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 you know. I hadn't thought about that, but that's efficient. And then, then coming down the front stretch, what was that? I mean, uh, you come down three, four, and uh, and when you come down over the bridge, there was a real steep bank and if you didn't make the corner you ran up on that big steep bank and I mean it was a steep bank just like the walls in here and I only got my mother to go to the races one time in her life and uh, the day she went to the races I come down off that hill and I ran up on that bank and my car rolled over and it landed on its wheels and we never slowed up and we kept right on going. That's the first and I think only time I ever rolled over a car in my life. It, it rolled completely right back on its wheels and kept right on going. Oh my gosh. <laughs> now, the, the, again, visualizing the, uh, the, the, the highway, the pits would have been off to the right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As you stood looking at the racetrack from the highway, the pits would have been to your right. And the and I'm trying to visualize the spectators, would they have been... Between the highway and the racetrack. So they would have been looking down kind of over the bank. And I think people used to sit in their cars some. Do you remember that, Skip? Yeah, a lot of them sit in their cars and then they'd Yeah, sit they'd the sit the in their cars and watch the race. Stuff like that. And then there were some bleachers, you know, just some makeshift bleachers there. They didn't get a big crowd, you know, but there would be 50, 75 people come, you know. So that was a lot of people, I suppose, at the time. If you had to measure the track, was it a kind of a quarter mile track? I would say it was close to a quarter <coughs> of a mile. Uh, a normal uh, final uh, race, uh, how many laps would that have been normal? I would say 25, but I don't know for sure. I yeah, think sure. I think the laps was probably 25, and I think the extra lap races were 35 laps or 50 laps or something like that. What was a normal? The old memory isn't as good as it used to. Well, be. it sounds great. And the good thing about oral history, as long as you say it, we believe it. Um, did you? Uh, did you? Did you find that? Who was your competition, Jim? I mean, it sounded like you had some early success there. And were there drivers that you said, "Man, they're they're pretty good." Well, some of them cats had been at it for a while before I started, you know. Right. And then and then other ones come along later that. Uh, Donnie Little was a real good friend of mine. He was a real racer. Uh, <coughs> Ronnie Blackmer came along later. He was a real racer. Uh, the James boys, I remember they used to, uh, there was four, three or four of them, four or five of the James boys, and they would bring, uh, about every three weeks, they had a new set of cars, you know, and they were hard to beat because right. they had fresh equipment all the time, yeah. you know. And fresh equipment back then was just a new car, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm visualizing that the, the number of cars that would have, on a normal day, be 30, 40 cars would have shown up? Would that I would say a, a, a real normal day would be in 20 cars. Uh, I can remember starting back in the, the 40s uh, up there before. So. But if you have 40 cars in the, in the final race, 
that almost like laps the field. Where do you have any room to kind of even maneuver, do you? Yeah, it, uh, it got pretty busy out there. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, you know, uh, I forgot about this, but the back straightaway was elevated enough that, and of course there was no guardrails, uh, if you got too far on the inside, the car would roll right down in, down off that back straightaway right into the creek. More than one car come down off there. Memories of Rollable, Jim. I mean, you obviously you, you were there virtually at the beginning of it. Uh, if you could say, Greg, here's one of the funniest things that had ever happened at the Rollable. Uh, what would you say? Oh, I I don't know. There was there was so many things that uh, the memory isn't as good as it used to be. But I remember Skip Furlow as a young lad. Uh, wearing a complete body cast. Now this isn't funny, but the water tank had fell off of the water truck somehow and crushed his leg or crushed his hip or something. And and he, uh, he was 14, 15 years old, walking around or hobbling around in a body cast. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that so well. And uh, I think that one of the funniest things that ever happened to me up there was I tore my transmission out in a heat race. And uh, I was going home, and back then, in order to put a little bite in the car, we used to run a motorcycle tire on the left front, mm -hmm. and a great big huge tire on the right front. And uh, so I tore second gear out of my transmission, and. Uh, the kid that was helping me, it was Alan Woody, he said, well, let's just put the motorcycle tires on the back. And that's not going to work, you know. He said, well, they're real small, it'll gear it down enough. So, wanting to start the feature, I put the, my little motorcycle tires on the back. Guess what? We won the feature with the little motorcycle tires on the back of the car. <laughs> Four inches. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen hundred fours. <laughs> in, a, in a fifty lap race, uh, you know, unlike today, I mean, it was really you didn't have no time for pit, no time for pausing. It was just fifty laps and go, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It was uh, it was survival. It wasn't so much racing as it was survival. Mm -hmm. You had to, you had to finish to win and uh, if they started 40 cars there probably wouldn't be 10 of them still running at the end of the race because they were either wrecked or blowed up I mean they blowed up so many motors these things were just old stock cars that were wore out on the street they weren't fit to be rolling on the street anymore <laughs> so we took them up there on Sunday afternoon and raced them now, at the same time state lines racing on Saturday nights too right uh, wasn't that in? Uh, was wasn't that in, in operation at the time? Skyline, Skyline was the first uh, speedway that ran late model cars. Okay. Then uh, the people that owned that, I think, sold that racetrack and built State Line. Okay. And State Line opened in '55, must have been '55 or '56, and. I didn't even know State Line existed. Right. Here I am racing at Roll Bowl, and I didn't even know it existed the first year or so that I, I got to remember, I lived in Sanford. That's really back in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> now, how far is Sanford, just to give me, for the, for the camera, how far is Sanford from the Watts Flats here? A long ways when you got to tow it up there with what we had to tow with, and especially with the chain. But it's, uh, Probably 40 miles. 40 miles. Yeah. So you, for the rollable, and looking at some of the old programs and some of the news notes, most of the drivers were really local people. Okay? They're always, always just local boys. And, and you must have come about the furthest distance. Yeah, I think uh, really I did tow the farthest of anybody that. Yeah. Because a lot of guys were from Asheville and Brockville and and Jamestown <laughs> and and. Uh, it was a local racetrack, and I wouldn't have known about it if Dick hadn't have come down. And what did I mean? You went out. You've gone on to a very distinguished career. 
in racing. Uh, what did rollable mean to you in, in the, the training curve? Well, uh, it taught you the competition. Mm -hmm. And it's all about beating the other guy. It doesn't matter whether you're riding a bicycle or whether you're rowing a boat or driving a race car, you got to beat the other guy. And uh, I didn't know how to win when I first started. It, learning how to win comes with experience. And, uh, and winning, participating, we participated for a long time before we realized that, oh, I think we won by accident. <laughs> and, uh, but then once you win, there's nothing like winning. Right. Right. Second place sucks. <laughs> At some point, you make a jump from the jalopies, rollable, to a state line late model. What's the big difference other than the car? Uh, the money. The money. The money. It's it takes uh, each class you get into. It costs a little bit more, and. Uh, my late model ride come by accident. I was working uh, at the auto body repair company in Warren, and it was probably my third year of racing. And Emery Mann, uh, Emery Mann's head mechanic was my boss. He's the guy that taught me everything I know about mechanics and welding and whatever. He, the guy was a genius. And, uh, and he was a stickler for do it once and do it right, and man, you had to do it right for him. And Emery come to the shop all the time, <laughs> and, uh, and I was, by then I was running Dempsey Town and being fairly successful on Skyline and Rollable, and, and uh, he said, you've got to have a late model race car. And uh, I said, I can't afford a late model race car. And he says, can you afford $50 a month? And I said, I could afford $50 a month. But he says, I have my 55 Chevy race car that's all ready to go. I want $500 for it. I'll get it financed at the bank. It'll cost you $50 a month. And uh, it came with two, two spare transmissions. Uh, spare rear gears, spare wheels and tires, $500, a late model race car. It wouldn't buy three tires today. <laughs> and uh, I towed it to State Line the first weekend, and, and I've been a late model race car driver ever since. And tell me a little bit about your career path. I mean, you, you st when did you start at State Line? 1950? It would have been 59. 59. Yeah. And that would have been end the end of your days at Rollable. I mean, yeah, that you was would, that you was. Try to do both. No, of them. no. And that, uh, and then Ronnie Blackmer came to Rollable. Did you ever race at Rollable, Skip, or were you too young? Oh, you ro raced there. Did you race there when Ronnie was there? Yeah, him and I. Uh, what was it? Uh, 60 when he started. But see, I'd already quit racing there, I think, 60. by the time you guys started racing there. But Rollable was where it all started. Without that, I might have never raced. You never know. And it started with a guy who'd been drinking too much who wanted to beat somebody else in a bet. A $10 bet. <laughs> That's what I learned tonight, didn't you? <laughs> it's still that way. <laughs> 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 Jim, uh, what was the demise of the Rollable Speedway? Why did it cease to exist uh, somewhere around 1960? I think it was, uh, it had ran its course. Uh, racing it was getting a little more sophisticated. People started thinking about insurance, you know. Uh, when I got hurt at uh, Rollable, uh, they must have picked up the tab for the deal at the hospital, I don't recall, you know. But I suppose that's what you did back then. If you somebody got hurt, why the promoter ran up and paid the bill, you know. I don't remember for sure. But how many racetracks we've raced at in our lives that you pay a pit pit entrance and, and you think you're getting insurance and uh, that's no sign that you are, you know. 
Jim, finish the story about the night you got hurt and you went home because your dad's... <clears throat> You knew your dad would be mad at you if you didn't finish the chores. Well, there's a little bit more to that story that uh, you haven't told the camera yet. Well, yeah, there is a little more to that. I, my, my side occupation was a grave digger. And there was a deceased that weekend. And I had started the grave Sunday morning, and I was down maybe two feet. And that's the main reason I had to go home, because they were burying that guy the next day, and I had to dig a grave. And I, has, I have a broken nose, I have no teeth. If you ever lost your front teeth, there's a hole in there you could drive a Mack truck through. And, but I went home, did the chores, and went up there and uh, started uh, digging that grave, and it's shale shale and clay ground and uh, hard digging, hard, I had to pick every bit of it. The shovel didn't work without the pick. And I'm up there with a lantern in the middle of the night, picking away, trying to dig a grave. My, every time I swung that pick, my glasses bounced on my nose. And at that time, I had Coke bottle glasses. And you just have never felt pain like that. That hurt, oh my goodness. And uh, later on that night, I went back down to the farm and I found a stick of dynamite and a couple caps. And the dynamite in the graveyards, and oh no, you're just not allowed to do that. <laughs> and, but I drilled me two holes, one in each end of that, down about five feet five feet deep and touched her off and that loosened the ground up and it, it shoveled out a lot easier. After that. <laughs> the good news is statute of limitations has run. <laughs> uh, we won't name the cemetery. <laughs> oh, that's so I paid the price. <laughs> you did. You did indeed. Uh, Randy was talking a little bit later about your actual career as you went from roller bowl, then to state line, and uh, ultimately at one point you had a chance to even race at Daytona. Right. How, how, the, how did all this progress, Jim? The, I was <coughs> always interested in uh, the big speedways, uh, never content to just be at state line. Uh, and I used to help Julian Boosink in the wintertime uh, when he, he would usually take a car to, to Florida. And, um, and he worked with a bunch of other guys, but I would always tag along and, and try and be on his pit crew and do anything I could do to be involved. And um, the first time I seen Daytona International Speedway, I had to be, I had to go on that racetrack. I mean, there was just, that was the whole goal of my life from then on. I had to do that. And uh, a friend of mine, Johnny Ditch from Ripley, New York, bought a brand new 66 Pontiac and drove it to Daytona and uh, proceeded to make a race car out of it in the pits at Daytona. And I got involved in that. And. Uh, became a friend of Johnny's, and the following year, he raced, come back, and he raced the car down there, but he worked, Smokey Unick was racing Pontiacs at the time, and he befriended Smokey, and Smokey gave him spindles, and gave him a rear end, and, and gave him all the stuff, and sold him stuff that he needed. And I got to meet Smokey through uh, him, and um, go to his garage, and see how a real race shop worked. And uh, then that lit the fire more, you know, really wanted to do that. Well, the following year, uh, Johnny was going to go down, and uh, so I took, I told him I'd, I was going to buy a new pickup truck, and, uh, and he had no way to get there. And I said, I'll, I'm going to build a new trailer, and I'm going to buy a truck, and I'll tow you down. And uh, so... 
he got his race car ready, and at that time I was racing GTOs up the state line. And um, I had a couple 421 engines, and uh, he, he put together a pretty good race car the second year, and uh, had an engine professionally built, and, uh, but I took my engine with us just in case he had trouble. Well, the guy that built the engine put the pistons in upside down, put the eyebrows on the bottom instead of on the top. And uh, when he went out to qualify, it broke every valve, bent every valve, and broke every valve in that engine and blew up all over the racetrack. And he didn't have any engine. So we only took parts with us. I had my block done, I had my crank done, I had my heads done, but the engine wasn't assembled. And uh, it's Thursday. It's Friday. It's Friday and the race is Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any rings or any bearings, so we went down to Smokey's and got rings and bearings and gaskets. And we carried this stuff all back to the motel. And we put this motor together during the night in the motel on a coffee table. <laughs> oh, but this is a movie. <laughs> And the guy that owned the motel got really upset with us when he found out what we were doing. But before the night was over, his wife brought us down cookies and, and uh, fed us. And there was a bunch of old engineers that were staying at this motel. And, and they were in there, and they were mic and bearings. And I mean, these guys were a lot smarter than I was. And but they're old retired engineers and stuff. And, but by daybreak, we had a motor together. And we carried, it took four of us to carry it out of the motel room and put it in the back to pick up. And we took it out to the racetrack and put it in the car and Johnny ran the whole race and finished in the top 10 with that old state line motor. My and um, then we brought the car back. I towed the car back home and it sat in my driveway. Well, while we were in Daytona, John Markham at ran the ARCA, we, we ran an ARCA, not NASCAR, and um, I called, well, John Markham had talked about this Texas sweep they were going to do the following month, and I thought, man, I really wanted to do that bad, and uh, so I called Johnny and I said, hey, can I borrow your race car? And he says, well, it's got your motor in it, do whatever you want to. I said, I want to go to Texas and do that deal. So, however it broke, we don't got no money. We just come back and date on. We don't have ten dollars, you know. <laughs> so how are you going to raise the money? And I called a, a junk, I had a small junkyard and I called a friend of mine that bought junk parts and I said, what have I got I can sell you? I need four hundred bucks. I said, what have I got I can sell you for four hundred bucks? He said, how many motors you got? I said, I got a hundred motors. He said, I'll give you $400 for 100 motors. So we jerked out 100 motors, and he came down and picked them up, gave us $400. We headed for Texas with this race car. And Julian had bought a brand new home in a Moody Ford, and Floyd Finelli was driving for him. And I knew Julian, I knew who he was, you know, because I'd been to racetrack with him a little bit, and I'd raced against Floyd at State Line. And uh, we get to Austin, Texas. What a trip, you know. I mean, this truck is a six-cylinder three-speed. And I'm towing this great big Pontiac behind me on this trailer. <clears throat> and, uh, but we got to Austin, and Julian out qualified me. I finished ahead of him in the race. And then we went to, uh, where did we go, Austin, and we went to San Antonio, Texas, the following night and raced. And he out-qualified me, but I beat him in the race again. And I finished the race. And then we went to Corpus Christi and got rained out, and then we come back to Houston 
and there was a big half mile racetrack at Houston. And Julian come over and he says, what tires are you going to run tonight? And I said, I'm run the same tires I've been running all along. He said, well, what tires are you running? I said, the ones I had on at Daytona. He said, you can't use them tires on these short racetracks. Well, I thought they were working fine. I didn't realize that you had to buy special tires for special racetracks, you know. And, uh, but anyhow, that's a 500 laps at a ha on a half mile at, at Houston. And uh, to all these guys got these big Hemi cars, and, and uh, they can only run about probably 100 laps, and they got to stop and put on tires and, buy, and put in fuel. And uh, we didn't have any tires, so the only thing we needed to worry about was fuel. So uh, I had pitted and got fuel a couple times, and uh, and I needed to pit again. I'm a lot of gas, and back then you used hand signals. You didn't have no radios or nothing. No, one was gas and two was oil, and I don't know what three might have been, you know. You just held your hand out the window. I'm holding my hand out the window. I need some gas, you know. And Julian had come over. Uh, his car had already blowed up or something in the race, and, and he was over in our pits, and he's telling, he's, he's told Julian was smart. He'd figured out my gas mileage, and he says, don't let him pit. He told my man, Red Lester, he said, don't let him pit. And uh, <coughs> so I'm holding out my finger, and they're saying, no, go. They put, we had big chalkboard, you know, and it had go on it, and then he put money on it, and and uh, I know I'm going to run out of gas, but Julian had figured my gas out, and uh, they gave us a white flag, and uh, now all these other cats, they're pitting all the time, you know, putting on tires, and I'm going around the racetrack steady, so they lap me, I lap them back. And uh, it comes down to the last lap of the race, my car runs out of gas going down the back street. But I'm going fast enough that I coast around, and I come in fourth in this great big race. My gosh. And uh, against Benny Parsons and Ramo Stott and Iggy Katona, and I mean, these are very important people. And it paid like $800 for fourth place, you know. That was a fortune, you know. <laughs> Especially with a borrowed car, you know. <laughs> and uh, so then we come back home and, and uh, so that was my first time I'd ever seen an asphalt racetrack. I'd ever been on an asphalt racetrack. And, uh, and it's no different than dirt. The only thing is you just don't slide around as much, you know. And uh, then Julian hired me to drive his race car the following year because of my performance down there. So that was probably uh, the real turning point in my driving career. What was your highlight, Jim? Of racing. I don't know. I, I think <coughs> probably uh, uh, that the coolest thing I ever did racing was I did the 24 hours at Watkins Glen one time, mm -hmm. and that I drove for six hours out of the 24, and I think that was the most fun thing I ever did mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, I never won anything big. Uh, I won the a lot of local races, and but as far as being on a big speedway, and, and uh, I almost won at Talladega, uh, so close, you know, but blew up in just a few laps to go. Did you ever have aspirations to, was, was the NASCAR circuit at that time something to really achieve? Was that the major league? It was, a, yeah, that was the major league. Uh, <coughs> Benny Parsons was a real good friend of mine, and he really helped me uh, when I ran ARCA. And then he be went on to become a, a NASCAR champion. And Dave Marcus was a real good friend of mine. Me, Dave used to work on my car, I used to work on Dave's car. And uh, Dave was a good Ford man, and I was a better Chevrolet man. And he was racing a Chevrolet, and I was racing a Ford. And one year in Daytona, he spent more time working on my car than I did. And uh, and Benny used to come over and help me a lot. And he used to bring over uh, 
Ralph Moody and, and guys like that to help me. So, uh, and Benny told me, he said, you got to do this. In, uh, must have been 70 or 71. He says, you just got to do this. You can do this. Right. But it, uh, I had a family and I had a business and what was your business, Jim? I had a wrecking yard. Did you? In Garland? In Garland, Garland yeah. Okay. And you raced up through when? Uh, pardon? How long did you race through? I, I quit in 76. Mm -hmm. uh, I raced for 25 years, basically. Uh, the racing changed, and it racing changed <laughs> about that time to where, uh, heck, we made our living racing right. for 10 years, you know. You worked in the winter and you raced all summer. You didn't do anything but race. Yeah. And you could make ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 clear with your race car, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and in 76, I drove uh, for Dick McLaughlin out of Connie, Ohio. And we had a decent year. It wasn't a wall banger or nothing, but we won five times, uh, which is not a bad year. Uh, ran good. And at the end of the year, we figured it all up, and, and uh, we hadn't made a dime. We had spent exactly the same amount of money we had taken in, mm -hmm. and uh, Dick felt so bad about it, he gave me the car and gave me both the motors for my profit for the year. Right. And, uh, and I sold them and started building a house and decided it was just, it was time, you know. And I, hindsight's twenty twenty and I would just got on top of my game when I quit. Yeah. I was young, 37, 38 years old. But you really never left racing, Jim. You no, stopped I really driving. You no. continued to to build a racing as a family. That's the only thing we know. We don't play golf. We don't play baseball. We race mm -hmm. as a family. This has been terrific, Randy. Any questions, Skip? What's the story that you know about Jim Scott that we haven't heard? He's told them all. <laughs> <laughs> What's the dumbest thing you ever saw Jim Scott do? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't care. <laughs> Those are some no, of the I've great stories. Jim do anything dumb. Okay, there you go. Any questions, Randy? No. If not, dumbest, thank you. Dumbest thing I ever did oh. was running over that tire up to Erie and breaking my back oh, for. God, I that. Oh, cow! Oh, that was a bad scene. That was yeah, a bad year. 1970. That was three weeks after David was born. And, uh, Set the scene on it. I mean, it's at Erie Speedway. Yep. And, and somebody loses their tire. Tire's on the track. I had seen the tire, the lap before that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I thought I, I seen it roll off the end of one and, or in three and four. And it must have went out and hit a pole and come back or something. Because I seen the tire roll. I seen the tire come off the guy's car, come off Johnny Boyd's car, come off his left front. And uh, the so I knew the tire was on a racetrack. And then I seen it the following lap. I seen it go off the end of the racetrack. And I had that little Mustang, and it was wanting to go. And uh, I was following Dave Turner and and uh, Jay Piler, and they were running side by side. And and I. I'm running half throttle, I want to go, you know, and uh, they split coming down the front straight away, and I seen that hole, and I headed for it, and there was that tire, and I had my foot right buried in the carburetor when I hit that tire, and the car flew way up in the air and come down broke my back. Talk to me about some of the, the names. I'm, I'm going to flash back to my youth. Uh, Squirt Johns. Real good friend. Uh, he was the first one of us that learned how to race. That cat knew how to make a chassis work. Uh, he was light years ahead of the rest of us in, in making a car work good. Mm -hmm. uh, Dean Layfield. The old master, he, uh, he drove my car one time, uh, my 55 Chevy. He had broke his car, and he was leading the points, and he came over and wanted to know if he could drive my car in a feature, and I said, yeah. So he took it out and made a couple laps, and he brought it in, and, and he changed every shim in the front end of that thing. And it was a handful, you know, always was a handful. After he did that, 
The car steered just perfect. I know now what he did. He'd give it some positive caster, but at the time I didn't know what he did. <coughs> and he died, didn't he? It was yeah, he got killed in a, in a race car. Got hit in the temple with a rock. Oh, golly. Back when they just wore a, a beanie helmet, you know. Yeah. Got hit right in the... Who would be the, the racer that you would least like to be on kind of a that last lap, one-to-one, -one, you know, who was the guy that you really just, I don't want to say fear, but you just didn't want to compete against it that, when it came down to that last Well, lap. Uh, there was, uh, Squirt was really tough. Uh, <coughs> Skip Furlow was really tough. Bobby Schnars was really tough. Uh, there was a lot of really tough racers. It, uh, Freddie Knapp was a tough racer. Uh, Jimmy Polaro, when he was in his prime, he run really good. Uh, but I think Bobby Schnars beat me one on one more than anybody else ever did. Yeah. Was Kenny Johnson racing when you were? Yeah, he he raced the first one or two years that I raced. Okay. Big Mall, and he was a good racer. Uh, he he did a little traveling, so he got smart too, you know. Right. That's what I recall, and Randy, you would know better, but didn't he, didn't he do some Daytona mm -hmm. stuff like that? Yeah. yeah. Tom Dill, I'll tell you, I, when you come down to the guy that you hate to be have around you uh, on the last lap, had to be Tom Dill. Me and Tom are best of friends now, but I'll tell you what, he parked me more than once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was wrong. Oh, he, was, he was from Erie? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Laugh about it. Tom comes up every year and hunts with me, and uh, he tells them he's got some real stories to tell. So he didn't mind bumping you around a little bit. Oh no, no. Were there other guys that sort of had that reputation, as far as just not being shy about? You know, he kept his space. Tom probably was as bad as any of them uh, <laughs> when it come to moving you out of the way. Uh, and there was other guys. Oh, Skip Furlow would move you if he had to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have a chance. You'll get a chance. chance. <laughs> but then I would move them if I had to, too. So, I mean, it was just a way of life. One final question. When, the, when you look at it and reflect back, did you, did you race? Was, was the race in your, racing in your blood for the sport of it, or was there money driven? It started out to be the sport, then it turned into the money, okay. and uh, now it's a, a money game. Right. He who spends the most goes fastest, sometimes, most generally. Back then, it didn't matter. Uh, number one, you didn't have the money to spend, and racing until the 70s, uh, most of the parts come out of a junkyard. You build everything. And I don't, I never said I was a really good race car driver, but I was a pretty good mechanic. And I could build a little better race car than the other guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, in the 60s, especially when I was running for Julian, uh, we just had a stronger race car. And, and it showed up in the long races. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jim, you've seen uh, racing evolve for the last 50-some years as a participant and, and now watching your sons and grandsons. Where do you see racing headed, say, 10 years from now? Tough question, but uh, they've got to do something about the cost. Racing engines now, uh, we buy used ones. Used ones are still $25,000, $27,000. Uh, good ones are thirty-five to forty thousand uh, dollars. You go to a stars race, you're running against thirty-five, forty thousand dollar motors, uh, and you can't do it with a homemade motor. You got to buy a motor. And uh, I think maybe I don't like to see it happen, but I think maybe Crate Motor is the answer. Uh, now they have a crate motor that costs $5,000, uh, $5,100, uh, makes 400 horsepower, 
everybody has to run it. It's a factory shield motor. Uh, so that's just for the camera. The, when you turn the term crate, you're visualizing that's something off a shelf that everybody uses the same that, thing. It's a crate. Everything is it. Everybody gets the same package. Gotcha. Right now, uh, David has an engine that makes 820 horsepower on a dyno. You know, uh, that's a far cry. When I started, we were looking for 100 horsepower. <laughs> You know, and uh, most of your, most of the racing that you've done up through the years until uh, the late 70s, uh, you did with 300, 400 horsepower. But uh, them old 427 Fords that Julian used to buy, them things used to make uh, 650, 700 horsepower. And uh, they are good motors, but the cars weigh 4,000 pounds. Yeah. Then we finally got smart, uh, couldn't figure out why uh, Frank Roman beat us so many years. He did it with a light race car, little motor with a light race car. Here we are putting, hanging more iron on our cars and going slower. And uh, I worked with a Chrysler engineer and. 70, well, 72, 73, and 74, and I built a race car, and I told him what it weighed. He said, you got to take 800 pounds out of that car. I said, you kidding me? I did everything I could to make it light. He said, it's 800 pounds too heavy. I said, the only thing I can do is leave out the motor. It's the only thing that weighs 800 pounds. <laughs> you know? But... Now, light, the cars are really light. Mm -hmm. And the cars, everything is aluminum and magnesium and carbon fiber and uh, 800 horsepower, yeah. 2,300 pounds. Wow. Different world. Jim, this has been terrific. Just terrific. Now you can sit and watch Skip when we go through this with him. <laughs> <laughs> My own that was.